Hopefully you are coming to this video from the first two videos in the Springfield horde of vintage silver bars videos. And I gotta admit, this one came at me uh, like a Mack truck. This was so much faster than even I anticipated. I'd be looking at another edition of vintage silver bars to my collection that have come from the Springfield horde of vintage silver bars. And that's exactly what this video is about. If you are new to the channel, my name is White Cross. You can call me White. You can call me Dub C. I answer to pretty much anything. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and click on that subscription button now, become part of this community. And if you're one of my returning subscribers, guys, I got to thank you for being with me here again. I think this is a really fun journey. So excited to be able to bring you information about this hoard and to show off some of the examples of the pieces that we've been able to uncover from this hoard that must date back 30 or maybe even 40 years. If you are new to the channel, I like to begin each of my videos with a simple disclaimer, and that is that I am not a financial advisor. I'm not trying to offer you any kind of financial advice. I'm simply trying to share some of my experience having bought and sold precious metals and rare coins for the last 30 or 40 years. And I also like to begin my videos with a couple of concepts that we can work back into it where it's appropriate. Uh, and I've got a couple to throw at you. They're pretty simple ones, but I think you'll dig it. The first one is an extension on the concept of serial numbers. We talked about serial numbers, I believe, in volume one of this series. Uh, and the idea was that when I've got a couple of different silver bars, or really any kind of collectible, and you've got a choice of which ones to pick, and everything else is equal, the value of the item, the condition of the item, the price, the year, the mintage, whatever else it is that you're comparing, and you have an option to look at the serial numbers. I made a, the comments earlier that I like earlier serial numbers. I think that there is some benefit to having those. And also sequential serial numbers. If you're in a situation where you can pick bars, and in this case, silver bars, that are uh, sequentially numbered with those serial numbers. And I gave the example of these two Weschler bars here that have very, very close to sequential numbers. That's kind of a deciding factor, but there are other things that you can use within the, the realm of serial numbers that can help you in deciding which of these items to pick up. I, uh, I like a website called AmericanRarities.com, and this is a, a website that's for currency uh, collectors. Uh, these are people that collect currency, uh, paper money. So uh, those folks have for a long time paid very close attention to serial numbers. Probably goes back to things like Liar's Poker, if you've ever played that. Uh, these are comparing serial numbers on, on bills, on currency. Sometimes it's comparing the numbers on them, almost as if it's a, a game of poker. It also sometimes just to see who's got the lowest numbered bill and the winner gets a drink bought for them or vice versa. That's kind of the idea. So those are two concepts that, um, that we use on silver bars that I use in determining factors. That's a low serial number and sequential serial numbers. But there are other things that you can look for. Um, how about repeating serial numbers? So, for an example, a serial number that went one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, it sounds kind of silly when you're just saying it out loud, but when you see it in type, or better yet, when you see it on a silver bar, that's a pretty interesting looking serial number, right? If you've just got random numbers versus something that's kind of an interesting sequence of numbers, I think that there is potentially value in those sequential numbers. How about um, so solid serial numbers? So, in this case, it would be uh, you know, three, 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 or one, 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 one. How about sevens? I know that a lot of people um, like to look at silver bars in a relationship with kind of luck and winning and and uh, treasure hunting and all that kind of stuff. And if you've got that kind of philosophy, having something that's got a bunch of sevens in the serial number, that's pretty cool, right? Even if it's not for you, it might be something that your eventual buyer will want. So given a choice, if you've got something that's got an interesting repeating number, an interesting uh, sequential number, I would definitely choose those. Another example, a radar numbers. That's a, an example of a, of a serial number that would be maybe one, two, three, four, three, two, one. So you can approach that bar from either side, from the very end to the very beginning, and you have a, a kind of a radar number. It's uh, repeating itself, the same numbers backwards and forwards. So you get the idea. There are lots of different ways, and I think the, the currency collectors have already kind of forged the way for us. All we have to do is take a look at what they're doing. I don't want to harp on it too much, but again, given the choice between bars that are otherwise uh, completely the same, except one's got an interesting serial number, I'm going to gravitate towards that serial number. And the other concept is one that I've talked about a little bit before in the past too, and that's the concept of a sweet spot. When it comes to any kind of a collectible and uh, the market is saturated, let's say for an example, 
uh, you can have way too many of something and that item will lose some of its luster. If you've got the market is too saturated, there's too many out there, there are far more of these types of items, let's take for example silver bars, than there are buyers, then you've kind of lost that sweet spot. Now we've got several examples of the Engelhard 7th series bars here, and we know, according to allenglehard.com, that Engelhard originally released at least 50,000 of those bars, and the very similar 10th series bars, and we'll talk about series again a little bit uh, here also. Uh, similar with those 10th series bars that look quite similar, about 50,000 of those pieces also. So there were, at least originally, somewhere on the order of 100,000 of these types of Engelhard bars out there. But they are a favorite of stackers, so even though there are tons of them out there, there is a very strong demand for those bars also. They fall within that sweet spot. But the sweet spot also works the other way. You can have too few of an item, and that can actually disrupt your sweet spot. It's especially true if the item is not especially interesting. Uh, back in the late 1960s, there were lots of people who were refining silver in their backyards or in their auto shop, places like that, primarily from things like uh, photographic film, black and white film, x-rays. These are things that use at least a little bit of silver, and there are easy ways to process these materials to get the silver out of them. This was something that was commonly done. But if you didn't have a full-fledged refinery on your hands, you might have turned out a few of, you know, kind of crude-looking cast ingots that didn't have any kind of um, marks on them at all. You didn't have any kind of stamp on them at all. You were just refining this item to get the silver out of it. Examples of those bars are still out there. And the problem with those bars is that we don't know anything about who made them. We don't know when they were made. They don't have any defining characteristics on them. We don't know the purity of the silver. There is no serial number. Uh, we don't know the weight unless we're actually weighing this item. So even though there may be very, very few of them, there are just so few people who want something like that in their collection that the prices never seem to have very much support. So they're outside of that sweet spot. Here's an example of another silver bar that was made in kind of that same period of time. This is an international vault refining bar made in the late 1970s. This bar, even though, uh, all, according to allenglehard.com, there were a few thousand of these bars made by International Vaults Refining, but there are a few of them enough that still exist, and the number of people who want to buy these mean that these bars generally carry a very high premium. Now, compare that to that recycled uh, x-rays and film bar uh, where there are very few examples, but there just aren't that many people, you can see that sweet spot can go either way. There can You can have tons of bars, and if there are lots of collectors, you're in the sweet spot. You can have very few bars, but if there are very few collectors, you are outside of that sweet spot. We'll talk about sweet spots again here a little bit later. And then lastly, I just wanted to bounce the idea off of series with you. I've been asked several times recently what I'm talking about when I say 7th series or 10th series. The series are simply um, a, an array of numbers that are assigned to a particular style of silver bar. AllEnglehard.com has done a fantastic job over the years in determining uh, which um, types of bars were produced by several different types of refineries. They've covered uh, 15 or 20, maybe even more refineries than that, and they're adding more of them all the time. And they've gone into the history of these silver bars, and based on the serial numbers that are used or the style of bar, whether it's horizontal or vertical, whether it's poured or cast or machined, they assign a series number to those bars. Generally speaking, but not all the time, the earlier the series, the earlier the bar in time. So a first series bar, generally speaking, is earlier than a third or fourth series bar. Now they do take other factors into consideration. For the example of Engelhard, they talk about bars that are made in America versus bars that are made in Canada. Uh, they talk about bars that are horizontal versus bars that are vertical. And that can also change this, the, uh, the series number. So you're not always necessarily looking at the oldest number, the smallest number being the oldest series. But generally speaking, that's the case. Also keep in mind that when they're talking about these series, there are varieties and variations within these series. So there are some examples that uh, Engelhard, for example, has put out within their series that have very, very small mintages of a very particular style of variety. Maybe they used a really uh, interesting font for just a very short run of bars within that type, within that series. 
or maybe they were co-branded with another uh, company's name. Maybe they minted these bars in this style, but you flip it over and the back has got advertising for a bank somewhere. So they can be a series, but they can be a very, very scarce variety within that series. My best suggestion, spend some time on allinglehard.com. Go through, especially if you're talking about the definitive pages, that's where they talk about the different refineries and the different uh, uh, ounces, increments, the sizes of the bars. You will find so much information about them. We'll talk a little bit about some of their writings a little bit later in this video too. So we've got some concepts. I don't wanna make this too dry because really I am just bursting with excitement. Hopefully you can hear it in my voice. I picked up some really cool stuff from this hoard again, and that's what we're gonna talk about here. So when we left off with volume two of this so far three-part series, and there is the potential for even more videos to be released in this series, we had uh, concluded the business. We had picked up these nine 10 ounce bars, 10 ounce class, some of them are kind of close to 10 ounces, from Engelhard, from Weschler Manufacturing, from Silvertown. These were the best nine bars that were brought in in this initial grouping. But I mentioned at the end of volume two that we think that this was only one half of the bars included in this 1980s, 1990s era uh, collection of 10 ounce silver bars. And I indicated that while the, uh, the heir that had sold these clearly needed some money, the heir that was holding on to the other half of these bars didn't seem to need the money that badly. So we didn't know when they were gonna bring these in. And I told you in the last videos that I was kind of keeping some of my powder dry because I thought there was at least the possibility the second group of bars was gonna come in. And based on the interesting bars that were included in the first group, I wanted to have some money left over to spend on those. In other words, I was trying to be as decisive as possible picking bars that were really neat and not going any deeper into it than I had to. Who knew? that uh, before the ink was even dry on those videos, if I can mix metaphors like I do all the time anyway, um, the, the air brought in this other group of bars. Now, the real kicker is that we think that this is probably still not even all the bars, but we'll burn that bridge when we get there. There's another mixed metaphor. Uh, what did this group include? This group included, you remember the last one, we obviously had Engelhard, Silvertown, and a few other varieties of, of bars. This one included bars from Liberty Mint. I don't see them that often. National refineries, I've actually had some national refineries bars in the past. I think I may still have a few of the one ounce bars. They're interesting bars, but again, maybe not as collectible. I think there's a differentiation between poured bars and the extruded or minted bars that have the kind of uh, shiny proof-like surface. I'll talk about those in a second here. Silvertown, well, there's a great example. They had more Silvertown bars. Unfortunately, they weren't this style, this original 75,000 run of early Silvertown bars. These were that 1980s, 1990s vintage with the prospector and his mule on them. They don't have serial numbers. They're in original vinyl. They are really nice bars, but they just don't excite me. They just don't have that pizzazz that I look for. Lots of those included in the second group. There was even a, a five ounce round from Silvertown, which was kind of interesting, but just outside of my wheelhouse, not really something I was interested in. Wall Street Mint again, lots of Engelhard, those commercial C prefix bars that um, are vertical, lots of those with the, the globe and the big E on them, and I'll show some pictures here, a few of those with the eagle on them as well. Uh, there were some corresponding Johnson Matthew bars. If you're familiar with the Johnson Matthew era bars, I'll, you know, I'll combine all of those images and show you what I'm talking about here. These are typical bars that you would have found in any coin shop that was selling precious metals, late 1980s, early to mid 1990s. There was an NTR bar, and I know that they went through some financial difficulties, but the, the existence of an NTR bar in this group kind of skewed the data points that I talked about in those earlier videos. Remember I said that there didn't seem to be anything that was earlier or later rather than maybe the early 1990s. I wanna say the NTR bars came out a little bit after that and I know that they had difficulties, financial difficulties and defrauded some investors or something along those lines. I don't recall exactly what the story was. But this definitely pushed the era, at least of the second grouping of bars, considerably newer than that first group of bars. There was, um, a bar by Hospital Trust National Bank. I'd never seen one of these before, and it was even in the original kind of a cellophane wrapper. So that one was on my short list. I thought that that was an interesting piece. And also on my short list were a couple of bars from Golden Analytical. Golden Analytical makes really interesting bars. They are a favorite of poured bar collectors. 
uh, they're that kind of longer version. Some people call those Kit Kat bars. I don't know that I would necessarily call the Golden Analytical bars Kit Kat, but they are definitely a longer bar compared to these flat bars that you see here or these older ingot type here bars, uh, which the Weschler bars are. Golden Analyticals, I've had some of them in the past. They have slipped through my fingers. I kind of wish that I had some two really nice examples in this second batch of uh, bars from the Springfield Horde. And they went on my short list also. But when push came to shove, I, I had already bought nine bars of this group. So we're already approaching maximum density. I've already put more money into silver than I had planned on. And once again, the price of silver, I think, is driving some interesting pieces into the marketplace that haven't been available for quite a while. But that also eats into your pocketbook when you were picking these pieces up. So I was faced with a dilemma again. There were a lot of stuff here that I wouldn't necessarily want. I thought all of it was pretty good quality, but it's not especially collectible. Remember, there's kind of that differentiation between the poured bars and the minted bars. I think that that's kind of a dividing line. Nothing wrong if you like those minted bars with the fancy proof-like finishes. Uh, those, to me, um, don't really have the nostalgia that the older style bars do. Those are the ones that I'm drawn towards. So that was kind of a deciding factor for me as well. Push time to shove. I knew there were several bars that I wanted to buy. But when we understood that there was the possibility of even more bars emerging, that really made me focus on just a few pieces because I do still want to keep a little bit of my powder dry. And if these bars emerge, I want to be able to put in a position where I can look through those bars and potentially pick something else up also. No further ado, let's get into it. You've already seen these nine bars. I'm going to try to get them out of the way here. Hopefully I don't topple my tripod while I'm doing this. There we go. How do you like the sound those make? I love that. All right. First and foremost, how about this one? A lot of folks out there probably recognize this. This is, believe it or not, my first Academy Silver bar. I don't even think I've had one of their newer bars that were the kind of extruded ones we were just talking about, those proof-like surfaces. I believe this is my first ever Academy Silver bar. Uh, per VintageSilver.com, they are a New Mexico refinery. They started about 1970. They were bought out by Brush Engineered Materials, which became Matreon, which morphed into a name that you might be more familiar with. Anybody have any idea? Raise your hands. Shout it out loud. Scottsdale, right? This is actually a precursor of Scottsdale. So the lineage there goes back a long ways, and these are actually bars that would eventually merge into the company that became Scottsdale. There are several different varieties of these bars, these smaller bars. This is not a 10-ounce class. I would call this a 5-ounce class. A little bit later in this video, we'll actually weigh these pieces like we've done in the past with this hoard bars. They have um, the weight stamped here, and there's some that actually have a countermark here as well. Um, according to a lot of the websites that are out there, these are 1970s. I think they're a little bit uh, newer than that. I would say 1980s. There's some indication that the bars that don't have the countermarks, that don't have the weight stamped on them, are maybe a little bit older. I'd like to believe that. I don't know for sure, but I'm saying early 1980s, probably what this bar is. Nice poured cooling lines there. This is just a really nice ingot. When you think of an ingot, this is what I think of. I love the shape of this bar. There were apparently uh, polished versions of Academy pieces, so even though this piece is a lot more polished and it doesn't have that rough hewn look that I tend to be drawn towards, I'm okay with this bar. I think it's kind of neat. Uh, just a really nice, fun, simple bar. Uh, I believe this is 4.8 ounces, and we'll take a look at that one a little bit later. So we're going to put that one right here. So these are the original ones, uh, and this is the newest batch of these bars. I'm always going to have these bars a little bit askew. Uh, my only Academy bar, what do I like about it? My only Academy bar, I like the spare nature of it and the fact that there's just not a whole lot of marking. It essentially just says silver, take it or leave it. I think that's kind of neat. And I also was able to get this at a very interesting price, this bar in particular, and I will do another video about that a little bit later. When push came to shove, that bar cost me exactly nothing, and I've got another video coming up about that. Remind me if you don't hear about it in the next coming weeks. The next bar is going to come as no surprise. You've seen this maker before. Uh, it's an Engelhard, right? 
what makes this bar different from the other angle hard bars? I've already said that I'm not really a big fan of the transitional bars. Those are the bars that kind of went from being horizontal to being the vertical bars. I like the old pour bars. So why did I pick this one up? When I saw this one on the counter, I was immediately drawn towards it because it's angle hard, right? That's one of the most fun bars to collect in my opinion. But I have never seen this bar before. This was a style of bar that even though it was transitional, I couldn't place it. And I went ahead and decided to take a gamble on this piece. Why did I do that? You see this mark right here, right? That is the Engelhard bull. That's what we call it. It's not really a bull. It's a mix of alchemy symbols. Uh, it's the, a mixture of the symbol for gold and silver, which are also the symbols for the sun and the moon. And combined, they become the symbol for platinum. Uh, all Engelhard also has a really nice piece of describing that entire process, how they chose those symbols, and I think it's a really neat thing for them to have used to identify their bars that are made in Canada. Um, I, I like the look of this bar. I like the feel of this bar. There was something about it that I could tell was slightly different, definitely Canadian, and I just don't have very many Canadian Engelhard bars. Interestingly enough, one of my subscribers told me recently that he had picked up a couple of almost sequential bars from Engelhard bar, uh, Engelhard, Canadian bars from Engelhard. And uh, it got me thinking, this was just a really neat um, serendipitous moment. The fact that he had just got these and I had just gotten this bar. He had no idea that I picked this bar up. So Canadian bar, it's a neat bar. It's in a remarkably good condition. Now I think these originally came in vinyl pouches too. And ordinarily something that was outside of the vinyl of this age would be pretty heavily marked. And you see it's got a few hairlines and stuff on it, but it's been really well taken care of. If I were to grade this as a coin, I would probably call it an AU58, maybe an MS60. Remember, that's a slightly problematic grade. This is just a really nice example. Per uh this bar, they only made about 5,000 of these. This is the second series commercial bar. Uh, I like the machine finish on it. I like the bowl on it. I like that it's Canadian. I like that it's a 5,000 vintage. Remember the 7th and 10th series Engelhard bars? There's that series word again. 50,000 pieces made. Of course, we've lost a, few, a lot of those to attrition. But when you've got a comparison of 5,000 pieces, that's a very small vintage. So this is a really small vintage. I don't have that many Engelhards, and I like the condition of it. Engelhard Canadians, and I like the condition of it. So all of those were the factors why I was drawn towards this bar. I'm trying to gauge whether or not you've got too much glare here. I'm sorry if you do. My lighting situation is maybe not the best. This next one I think is really cool. And I'm hoping that you guys can provide some input to it, especially you guys who are much more seasoned when it comes to the older poured bars. This one immediately caught my eye because it's so different from the rest of the bars that we saw. How about this one? This is a really interesting bar from Tri-State Refining Company. Uh, they're out of Sioux Falls, I believe. Now, there are several different things about this bar that I really like, and I'll go, I'll tick off kind of the, what they are a little bit later, but right now let's just talk about who Tri-State Refining is. Originally incorporated Sioux Falls Tri-State Refining, 1973s. They became Tri-State Refining Company in 1978. Uh, and it was probably around this period of time because by 1980 they were called Tri-State Refining and Investment Company. So the fact that it's just got the TSRC, Tri-State Refining Company, leads me to believe that this is probably 1978-1979 vintage. So it's a very old bar. You can find Tri-State Refining Company bars out there, but this is the only example that I was able to find that has this picture frame design. This picture frame, that's what they're called, with a little bit of a raised edge around the outside. This was a popular style of bar for a very short period of time. It's my understanding these are a little bit more expensive to make, but they look a little bit more formal. There's something a little bit more snazzy about them. And I can't find another example of a picture frame from TSRC. Now, this bar is also what we would call a Kit Kat bar. You can see when you're comparing, these are both 10 ounce bars, but look how different they are. They are worlds apart in terms of what their style is. Called a Kit Kat bar because it looks exactly like a bar from a Kit Kat chocolate bar. That's exactly what it looks like. It's got that even uh, traditional kind of ingot form, this elongated size. It's got the original sprue lines where they ground off the sprue is the um, where the silver would have poured through the mold to get to this and make the bar. They typically grind those off. The edges, incredibly sharp. Uh, I mentioned that with this uh, Engelhard bar, the 11th series bar. That leads me to believe that this bar has not been handled very much. Pure silver is quite soft, and when you've got really sharp 
edges on a piece that is 40 or approaching 50 years old, those kinds of edges get worn off, uh, just getting bumped around, knocked around for the last several decades. And these edges are still nice and crisp. So it's got everything going for it that I can possibly think of. It's got a beautiful natural patina. It's got really cool pouring, uh, cooling lines. It's got that picture frame style. It's got the Kit Kat style. It's got the ingot style. It's got the sprue. Man, everything you could possibly want in a silver bar. And it's also kind of an interesting weight, right? 10.30, what a strange weight. This is a neat bar, so glad I got that. So you can tell that I'm excited about that bar. It's just got everything going for it. If you know of another TSRC bar that is in that picture frame style, definitely let me know about it. Um, this is one of those questions about sweet spots, right? There are lots of KitKat TSRC, and there are lots of uh, TSRC bars that are a little bit more of the traditional ingot style, that kind of uh, chunky, blocky style, kind of like the International Vaults bar here. But I have yet to find another bar that matches that look. And, uh, you know, is it a sweet spot? Is it outside the sweet spot? I'm inclined to think that that is a very sweet spot. I think that is a really cool bar. So now we've got three new bars to add to the original nine. The last bar that I was able to pick up from this group, and again, I'm trying to keep some powder dry just because we don't know what's yet to come. This bar from PMP. Uh, so this is another one of those bars that we're going to address the sweet spot. PMP, a little known uh, refinery. There just doesn't seem to be very much information out there. VintagePoorBar.com shows one uh, that is number 913, and you can see that this one is 10080. That's not the weight. That's the serial number. Let me flip it over here in a minute. So Vintage Poor Bar has one with their serial number 913. It weighs 10.35 ounces. And mineral exchanges, are they still active? I thought that they were, but I'm not 100% positive. Sold one of these bars not too long ago, a 6.88 ounce bar uh, with a serial number that is, um, let me see if I can find it here in my notes, number 928. So they're right in that same range, right? From 913 to 928 to 1080, all pretty close together in those serial numbers. That one 6.8 ounce version of the bar sold in September of 2022 for $725. Now that was before the most recent run up on silver. So I think that there's something very interesting about these bars. It too has a little bit of a picture frame. You can see that these edges are just slightly raised. That traditional ingot style, really beautiful cast lines. This bar just has everything you want in this really kind of quaint looking uh, bar style, ingot style um, logo for the company, the PMP logo. Where do you see the back of it though? 12.93T, that's the weight. So this bar weighs nearly 13 ounces. This bar is heavy in your hand. Uh, and then obviously the 999 fine. When uh, I did videos, and I've done several videos on uh, the Canadian, or rather the Mexican Libertad, and I'm a big fan of the earlier vision of those uh, Libertad silver coins, 1982, 83, 80, 45, that kind of reign, because they were a smaller diameter and that made them a thicker coin and that gives it a really nice heft. I wish that Mexico had kept making them in that uh, dimension because there was something really special about that. They understand silver and they understand the excitement of feeling something heavy and chunky in your hand. This bar has definitely got that element too. When you pick this up, you are, wow, that is a heavy creature. Uh, and again, look at those cooling lines. Look at all the bubbles, air bubbles and everything. This bar just has so much going for it. A very unusual bar. If you know of any other PMP bars, definitely let me know. As of right now, this is one of only three I could find, and it is by far the heaviest of those three. Sweet spot, outside the sweet spot. I'm tending, uh, I'm inclined to say that this is definitely sweet spot also, but you never know. And one of the difficult things about this bar is because it wasn't a 10 ounce bar, this one cost a lot more money, right? At almost 13 troy ounces, this was another three ounces of silver to add to that price. And you know where silver is right now. So this is by far the most expensive of the bars that I picked up from the Springfield Hoard, at least to this date. So there we go, four brand new bars to add to it. We're gonna run through the Sigma, we're gonna run through the scale like we did with the original series of bars. In fact, let's go ahead and get ready to do that. So which one is your favorite? Which one do you like about these bars? Is there any that you would have uh, decided that you would have picked up instead? I mentioned before that I really like those golden analytical bars. 
I looked at those online as I was shooting this video. 25 current auctions online for those golden analytical bars. 43 auctions for those that have closed recently. So when you can look at one of these bars online and see that they have that kind of recent sales history, then they just aren't as scarce as some of these other bars. And I like the golden analytical bars. If I had a little bit deeper pockets and I hadn't allocated so much to the rest of the bars in this uh, hoard, I might have picked at least one of them up. I like them that much, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. 4.85, that's right about where I thought this one was. That's the Academy bar. Let's go with the Engelhard. In keeping with Engelhard, as I've said with all of the Engelhard bars, they tend to run just a little bit north of their stated weight, so 10.02, right where I would expect it to be. The uh, TSRC, it says 10.30, 10.301, that's pretty close. Remember, we're on the Navajo blanket, you're not really supposed to do something soft under a scale, so I'm comfortable with where that is. And then this, uh, finally, the PMP bar, 12.95. Stated weight on this is 12.93, so we're really close to that too. So there's where we are with the weights for the new bars. Let's see where we are with the Sigma. And one of these bars is a little bit tricky just because, and that's the PMP bar. I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but this is a really big divot here. This actually is a little bit concave. It's a little bit tricky to get this bar to read. We'll show you in just a second. Again, with the Sigma, you have to uh, select a pre-selected um, range that you were going to be looking at. In this case, we're going to be looking at 99.9% .9 pure. There are certain presets. You can't just put something on the Sigma and have it tell you what it is. You have to select a preset, a preset and it will either agree or disagree with you in the, within those brackets. Remember, I label this position on those brackets with a number. So we're going to start with the Academy. Oh, try to get it centered. <clears throat> That's important too. You see the little green glowing eye there. You have to get the bar centered as much as you can. In this case, I would call that a zero. Remember my designations, not metalytics designations, but my own white crosses de designations for those five spots within the bracket. Dead center is zero. To the left is negative one, negative two. To the right is positive one, positive two. It doesn't really impact the quality of the silver. It's just where the item falls on that range, and I think that's an important thing to note. The Engelhard bar. Again, we're going to center it exactly just to see where it falls. Uh, I would call that a negative one. Hopefully you can see that. The cursor is one spot off of dead center. So instead of being a zero, that's a negative one. TSRC dead center. I like where that one's falling. I'm perfectly fine with that one. I would call that a zero. And then finally the PNP bar, and this is the difficult one because of that convex nature. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. You see that cursor is almost off the end of the charts there, and that's not true. I know this bar is a good bar, so you just try to find the flattest surface that it's going to be able to read. I don't think it's going to be at the top of the bar. That would be your first uh, guess also. You can see we're outside of the brackets. It's just not making good contact because of that picture frame style. It's just not hitting where it needs to. So we're going to try the edge of the bar and see where we are. We're definitely within the brackets now, right? I like that a little bit better. How about on this side? It's a positive two. So I don't have any question in my mind that this bar is 999 pure silver. It's just in such a strange shape that it's hard to get a really good reading on it. Remember, the Sigma has come out decades after this bar was made and the people that made this bar weren't even thinking about what a Sigma would be. So all of them within, that, uh, within the cursors or within the brackets, all of them are good silver. All of them are exactly where they should weigh uh, according to what we would expect for these vintage bars to weigh. Uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Would you have picked up the golden analytical bars? Do you think I was silly to pick up the bars that I did, those, the three new bars? Uh, remember, that's the Academy, the Engelhard, the TSRC, and now this PMP bar. Uh, I think these are great additions. They are so unusual looking. I've already got tons of the Engelhard bars. There's nothing new about those, but I like them. I'm glad to be able to add those to the mix. There is something very interesting about bars like this TSRC bar. It's such a Kit Kat. It's such an elongated piece. It's got that picture frame. It's got the cool cooling lines and bubbles on it everywhere. There's just something really compelling about the four bars that I picked up uh, from the second grouping. And like I said, there are apparently even more bars coming down the pike. So I may be updating this video with another one. Let me know what you think. Let me know which of these bars is your favorite from the second or from the first group that I bought, the second group that I bought. Let me know which ones you'd like to have in your collection. 
if you would have done anything differently, if you have any questions about how I approach the decisions for these bars, if you have any additional information about the PMP or the TSRC, specifically the picture frame style of the TSRC, again, trying to determine whether or not we're within or outside of that sweet spot. Uh, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Share it with your friends and family who like this kind of thing. We'd love to build this community. We are barreling towards 3,500 subscribers. I love that. Hopefully by the time you're watching this, we are far past that. Click on that subscription button if you haven't already. If you have any suggestions for videos you'd like to see me make, whether it's for Precious Metals or Rare Corns, somewhere in between, that's perfectly fine. Let me know about those ideas. We do have some videos coming up very soon that were suggested by some of our subscribers, and I will give you a shout out in those videos if we make a video based on your suggestion. And as always, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your journey as we go deeper into the world of coins and physical precious metals.